Uh, our next talk has been scheduled on a short notice. Uh, it is held by Daniel Domscheit-Berg uh, <laughs> on popular demand, and he will tell us more about his new project, Open Leaks, uh, its implications, and how it's going to work, I hope. Thank you very much. Please give it up for Daniel. Okay, uh, so uh, can everyone hear me um, with a microphone? Okay, hi. Uh, first of all, I'm happy to see so many people that have come, even though it's uh, on such a short notice and in um, competition with the Security Nightmares talk. So um, it's good to see you all, and it's good to see that you have an interest in, I guess, the topic I should have been talking about from the beginning on. Um, just one short correction, this is not my project, I have to make that perfectly clear. I'm just one of the few people and actually um, one of the people that can't really invest too much time at the moment. So there are many others that are working on this idea um, and I just wanted to make uh, that clear in the beginning. So, um, actually now I realize that I do not have the slides on that screen here. Um, well, anyways, um, so um, what, we did, what I'd like to do is I'd try to explain to you um, why actually uh, we are working on this project and a bit what the history behind it is and why we have chosen to do this the way we want to do it. So um, what is the problem? The problem is that there currently is just one or two or maybe a handful of sites by now that deal with a topic around distributing material from anonymous sources to people that have an interest in receiving such materials. So, um, as we're all pretty much aware, I think centralism never is a good thing, neither if it comes to technology nor any aspect of society. So, ideally there should be a thousand WikiLeaks sites or a thousand Cryptome sites or whatever. So, why aren't there one thousand of these yet? So, there are a couple of reasons for that. One is that not everyone has the guts to do that. So that is something we have found out in the same way that you won't find lots of ISPs that are as good as PRQ in Sweden, for example, um, that stand up to you as a customer and not back down to the first legal request they get. In the same way, you won't find too many people that are willing to create such a project and, and run into some hassle with it, maybe get into some terrain where they don't understand what they're heading into. Um, Another thing, and that is probably one of the biggest barriers, is that there's an enormous lack of knowledge on how to do that. And um, that's what we found out in the last three years, is that we, in the WikiLeaks project, and people surrounding surrounding projects have built up lots of expertise on how to do these things correctly, and what are actually the things you need to consider, what do you have to take into account. So what is the legal and the technical side of all of this and how do we manage that knowledge? And the third part is that um, if you're dealing with full documents and not just stories, um, first of all you need these documents to be writing any stories at all and on the other hand restricting the flow of these documents can prevent any good stories from coming out. So the flow of these documents um, is way more rigorously um, controlled or um, people are trying to uh, trying much harder to control that flow of information um, much harder than they can try to control the flow of stories for example so you would try to do whatever you can to prevent any source document from getting out there in the first place and that is these are the three barriers that need to be addressed um, and that need to be regarded um, and taken into account of why there are not a thousand sites doing that already. So it's just, especially the second point is not trivial um, and has to be regarded. So the question is basically how do we get from a few projects to a lot of projects and how do we diversify this whole field? And there are a couple of approaches you can take to that. Um, one very obvious one, or that's first of all uh, the process in general so you understand it. Um, we have the knowledge about something and whether that is the knowledge about a document or the knowledge about how to build a system that can accept the document. 
um, that information then goes into um, the whole submission process. So it's either creating a technical site that can accept submissions or it is a submission itself. Um, there's a cleaning process after that where the information that is received has to be cleaned in some form or another. Um, that also has a technical counterpart again. So there's you need systems that can and processes that can deal with inf anonymizing and information, stripping out metadata, bringing information into a format that everyone can use, into a standardized format. Then there's the whole review part. That review part is basically what journalists are doing. So um, they are reviewing a document, they are verifying if it's true or not, if it's a, if it's a, um, a forged document or not. They verify the contents of the document, they do an analysis, they write up stories about it, whatever. So that is actually a really big chunk of work there. And in the end you have a release part. And that release part has different angles again too. So you might just want to release a story based on a document or you would ideally want to release the document yourself uh, or itself. Um, if you release the document itself, um, that is totally different uh, from the, the requirements you have um, from releasing just a story based on it. But all of these things have very different requirements and it's very important that all of these requirements in some way can be addressed. Because if just somewhere within that chain you do not have enough resources or you do not have enough manpower or experience or whatever, then the whole process is being impacted and what you experience is bottlenecks. And in the past we have experienced a lot of these bottlenecks which made us very unhappy and um, if you give a promise to neutral parties that you would deal with what they give you then you have to sort of stick to that promise. So getting rid of these bottlenecks um, is one of the things that we try to achieve. So how do we get from many or from a few to many sites? Oh, sorry, uh, there still is one more slide where just to show you, these are all the parties involved. Um, we have uh, sources, there are volunteers that want to help out. That's one of the experiences we made also. It's very, very complicated to manage lots of volunteers. So just from the beginning or, or from, from December last year when we were here in the Congress, um, in the following three or four months there were like maybe 800 programmers that turned up that and they, I mean, this was great. It was such a good experience, but it was a very bad experience on the other hand too because we, we couldn't get them anything, get them to do anything just because some people were just writing us, they want to help, and then others sent in CVs of 10 pages. So you had this immense gap between not knowing anything about someone and then knowing way more than you want to know. And it's pretty hard to standardize that as well, to know actually who are the people that you could use because they speak the programming languages you, you, you can use or because they have certain skills or not and all of that filtering is very, very problematic. So that has to be addressed too and, and these people have different requirements. So then there's reviewers, people that can understand material, that can read a document, that can have a look at documents and understand if these documents are real or if it looks like a forge. Um, there's project staff that has to manage all of this, that has to take care of all the servers. Um, there's the whole public that wants to be informed, that wants some, some buzz going on, some website they can go to and see what's happening. Um, there are NGOs, there's the press, there potentially is a government that has their own interests. So these are all sorts of different parties. And what we found out, what is the most, one of the most important points here is that they all scale completely differently. Some of these are very quick, they are very dynamic. They can, if you had a system to manage them efficiently, you could pull in a lot of resources and others are very slow. They need time to do work properly, um, they are stuck in their own organizations that have slow processes or whatever. So they all have different capabilities to scale. And that's why all of that has to be broken down somehow so that you can address all of these areas in the fashion that is most suitable for them. <clears throat> if we look at how leaks work, actually, we can see two different uh, areas. So, or basically, actually, that is a, um, it's going from the local scale to a global scale and there's a lot in between. But if you look at the local scale, it's on a per country level, for example, or if you go even lower in a regional or like physically local level, 
then they ha these have localized problems. So you need to make sure that you transport the information as close to where it matters as possible, just because something about corruption in a small department of a small town here in Germany or in another place in the world will just drown in the flood of, let's say, in the vicinity of a release of a few thousand documents from a war or diplomatic cables or whatever. So these two cannot compete with each other or they cannot even coexist with each other because one thing is just gonna shut up the other thing. So what you need to make sure is that you that you distribute the material as close to where it matters as possible. And that is especially true for all the local stuff. So the local stuff also is much more loosely coordinated. So if you think about having, let's say, 100 local newspapers or organizations that are active on a local level, level involved with in, in something that is coordinating all these efforts, then what you will find is that they don't need to talk to each other very much. So if something is happening in a small town in Bavaria, it doesn't, I mean, it's good for that local newspaper maybe, but it, that local newspaper doesn't have to coordinate with a local newspaper in Kiel or wherever, just because they don't have anything to do with each other. That's what's different for all the global stuff, just because the bigger something gets and the more area it touches, um, the clearer it is that there are many parties that would would want to be involved and that also could potentially cooperate with each other in achieving a more efficient goal or something more worthwhile, getting more information out, a better analysis, whatever. So you have to scale from a, from a point where you have to be able to have one entity, one small entity maybe working on something very small and still be able to pull in lots of small entities to form a big union that is working on a large publication, for example. So, um, yeah, w work on such data amounts. If you look at, I don't know, the cables, the Iraq stuff, um, the, the Afghan war logs, all of that, these are really large amounts of data. And processing that data, um, standardizing it, um, working on all these things is a tremendous amount of work. And you can only address that in any way if you can scale to that problem. Um, Yes, so what are the concepts that we can use to address that? Uh, we could just make a clone. So we pull together an all-in-one website that, has, that is combining everything that we talked about before, that is trying to address all these different entities or individuals that, that it, it would have to reach. Um, it is still only one more, so even if you make one clone, what comes out is just one more. So we would need like a thousand groups of people that would make a clone in order to get to the thousand websites that we would want to have. Um, it does not address the structural problems the one and all solution has. So you still have all these problems of bottlenecks, of accumulating power, of um, potential for abuse whatever, all of that is still trapped within one organization and you cannot resolve these structural problems. Um, you have outside attack vectors that interfere with the scaling of internal processes and overall effect effectiveness. So if you, let's say, if you manage to keep a key person in that organization busy for long enough, then what happens is that you're stuck in a position. So um, that can all have a very easy impact on internal process is just because it's not distributed enough and it's just too centralized. And the last one point is important. Um, we never, that's why it is important to understand also that we are not a competitor We, are in, in respect to WikiLeaks. What we are doing is not competition. We just feel that the approach should be different. And that's, I think, hopefully everyone here understands that just because you, most of you probably have developed open software at some point in time. Um, there is, it's, there's a perfectly valid reason for lots of different approaches to the same problem, just because it will make sure that you hopefully can address that one problem from a lot of different angles and therefore cover all the requirements that different interest groups have. So um, what, what we do is 
as much as we can tell right now and as we feel it, um, is a different approach and I think it's going to be a more effective approach, more efficient approach also. Um, but it's not that we would deny WikiLeaks place in this world or anything like this. It's a tremendously important project and it has caused a lot of things that we wouldn't be talking about today if it hadn't been there. Um, yes, so another possible concept uh, would be that you just commercialize it. So you can just create a company that is dealing with this issue, that is um, building up a structure that can carry a thousand users. Um, doesn't help you because if it is a commercial company and it is run as such a company, um, I'm pretty sure that you would face a lot of political pressure that um, that could not sustain either just because it's commercially oriented and you could just cause the whole economic side so much trouble that it wouldn't be a worthwhile endeavor anymore. So I'm not sure how much such an idea would work out commercially anyways because there's just too much idealism that is involved in this. So, and the idealism always has to ca carry heavier to way more than whatever the financials of such a project look like. So even if it is not worthwhile doing it for the money, or if you, if you constantly have to spend more than you get in donations or so, that would be unfortunate, but it would still be necessary. So you cannot, you cannot focus on a commercial side of that just because you would probably, it wouldn't make sense from a business perspective. Um, yeah, the, the, the whole fragility, if you run a business, the way that political pressure can be exercised on a business, all these things um, do not make it uh, worth going in that direction. Also, if you're the only p company that is offering this, or if you commercialize it, you would not have an interest in sharing the experiences you have and sharing the knowledge you have and that you build up over time with others because that is your unique selling point. That's, what you, that's your value in the market, so to say. And as soon as you start giving away that knowledge, opening it up for others, again, you're destroying your commercial fundament. So that whole commercial idea doesn't make any sense either. Um, there's another solution, which is the pure academic solution. So all you do is, all you could do is just put up all the information, the documentation you have, all the knowledge and technical developments and put that all together and then hope that lots of people are just picking this up and using it. But then again, how do you make sure that you document this all in a fashion that someone just has to read that, you don't know where he's coming from, you don't know how much he understood before, what else he knows. So how, how do you make sure that someone after taking this information actually has a good basis for creating such a project? So in the end, what would turn out is, as we see a bit what's happening today with all these um, Indo leaks and Brussels leaks, and I don't know what, what other websites are coming up. Um, it's, a great, it's a great development and it's very important, but I do not see any knowledge transfer happening yet. And I have no idea what, what the technical basis is these people are using. And uh, the technical basis is very complex. So, um, and the worst thing that could go wrong is the technical side, which would compromise a source or uh, which would, I don't know, have some, some safety problems, or security problems, and then it's, it's all for nothing. So if, if that end fails, it's, it was all for nothing. So how do you make sure that, that these match up? Um, that's not something you can do with a pure academic approach. Um, all you would do is foster some unknown number of projects where you do not know how good it is implemented or whatever. So. This comes, uh, come, brings us to a solution that we have thought about, which is just, as it's pretty popular in cars these days, we just make a hybrid, you know, and take the best things out of um, different, uh, all these different concepts. So, what we did is we identified all the functions within that process, within the process from where a document comes in until the point in time where it gets out again to the public and we identified whatever has to happen in between. And then we started dividing all of that stuff up a bit and see if it can be sort of clustered into different areas of, of work that belong with each other but that are not necessarily related to each other. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's a really simple graphic but basically um, 
if you if you see that that uh, middle part as the system um, basically what what uh, a regular site would look like you would just have one arrow on the left and one on on the right and no cut in the middle and it would all just be one blob so something goes in and it goes out somewhere so we'd like to open up the 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 amounts of of, of ways how something can come in and essentially at some point in time someone will open up uh, the ways of how it can go out too but these two have to be separated from each other. There has to be one component which is only taking care of receiving things and then another solution for taking care of how to publish all these things. Both of these sites, left and right, they have very, very different requirements. And what we learned too is if you, all, if you put both of that into one organization, um, you will fall prey to becoming too powerful because it is you that decides on how things are being prioritized and it is you who decides on who to work with on publications and all these things and by all these decisions you have to take you're leaving a standpoint of neutrality and that standpoint of neutrality is very very important because what all of that only can be is a service it's just the service that is being offered and it must not contain any politics and any personal preference or any personal dislikes about whatever you're going to publish or what you must not publish. As soon as you leave that standpoint, you're just a tool for whatever power is using your tool or maybe your own interests in power. And that's not what technology is, should be for. Technology should be neutral and it should be equally given to whoever has an interest and a need in it. And that's the only way I think it will help society to develop anyway anyways. So, um, yes, so we're dividing these two up. That is um, one important point and what we do is only the, sec uh, the, the left half of all of this. Um, but I'll get to that in a point. So, you break down all these functions and different attack vectors too, so you understand how uh, your organization, the, the ideal that you pursue, how that can be politically attacked, how it can be technically attacked, and then you break down all these different parts. So one thing that comes out of this is that at some point in time you will be able to scale um, to up to the security and safety needs for those using the system without too much of a sacrifice. So that first of all is for people that want to put, into, put in material into that system. So you can focus way better on, on what the needs for these people are. And on the other hand, you can also focus on providing tools and means to the people that will use the system to, to get information, to receive documents, and provide them a secure and uh, safe environment in which they can work, in which they can collaborate, in which they can grow a community. That's what we want to work towards. And on the other hand, you also, if you have break and broken down all these parts, you can avoid secrecy for yourself. And that is something we fel felt is very important too. Um, I tried to say that yesterday in the talk already. Um, I do not believe that running an organization that is more an underground operation, or however you would want to call that, than a real organized thing is not the way we should deal with this. This topic is way too important. And this whole topic, the right to disclose information to the public, the right to break a secret because it's, it's not moral to keep that secret, all these things are very important for the functioning of our society. And we must not contain that duty to take care of this within something that has to stay in the underground, in the shadow somewhere that no one can understand that no one can know about how it actually works, but it must be a, an organization that is as, as transparent and as open and as robust as any organization can be. So that is what we should all work towards, is that we can stand in the sunlight ourselves and enjoy that we are creating a more transparent society and not create a transparent society while sticking around in the shadows ourselves. So. When breaking down all these different parts, we can get to that point where we can be tra more transparent ourselves too, opening up how it is working, how it is functioning, why it is working these ways. Um, 
that's basically where it all broke for us uh, with WikiLeaks. Um, we could not get onto a basis anymore where we had broken down the responsibilities in the organization and had this more clearly defined and that's where uh, the roads parted. So what do we do? Um, we provide these three steps. We provide knowledge, we provide means and methods for submissions and we provide a cleaning environment for that information that comes in. Um, we're starting out with a knowledge base. As I said before, one of the problems you can have is that, uh, or one of the problems that exist is that you need, you need knowledge on how to build this. You need a lot of legal knowledge to understand what are the specific requirements for the press, for publications, for sources, for journalists to protect these sources in different countries of this world. Ideally, something like this, a very comprehensive um, collection of such information should exist for all countries in the world at some point in time. Um, there are different organizations that are working on similar things, um, but no one has started to collect all these angles together. So um, I'm pretty sure that we will work closely with a lot of other existing organizations. Just the Digital Rights Watch, for example, is a good example. Um, they are here too, I'm not sure if uh, Stefan is in the room maybe or so, but um, they have started collecting like a meta collection of different things around freedom of information on the internet about our digital rights and all these things. And we'd like to bring in that one angle that deals with the publication standpoint and the source protection standpoints. So we will do uh, what we will create and that's going to launch as soon as the website up um, is building up a knowledge base. So gathering information on how the press can receive material, how material can be legally submitted, um, all sorts of surrounding information that might be interested to people in this field. So, and in the end, um, map out what the legal landscape looks like and map out how for each country, for each situation a organization is in, they could in the best way approach being legally protected and still run such an anonymous post drop. So, and once you know legal and operational issues, um, that's how you can, can start working on it. And if at some point in time you realize that there's a need for more of these platforms, you can just use that knowledge too and, and do another fork or create a sister project or a clone or whatever. So do something that just has specific needs for a certain area in the world or for a certain topic that is important to society. So we feel that this part is really important so that people can do it themselves and we don't want to be any, everything anyways. So we don't want to scale endlessly. We want to provide something that works for a couple of organizations or um, a few dozen, a few hundred maybe, I don't know. But as soon as that has reached a healthy size, um, by that point in time, we hope that others have come up with the same idea anyways and started using the knowledge that we have gathered and built tools for themselves. Um, the submission system, the second part, uh, is where we focus on technology and I mean, that's where we come from and that's what we're good at and that's what we believe should be focused on um, to build technical processes and not just too much politics. Um, so, there are parties out there that you already trust. Um, there's, if you, for example, look at the role that the CCC has, uh, the CCC is uh, acknowledged as a community that has technical expertise that acts as an independent reviewer for technology that is being deployed by other people. Um, that just as, acts as a watchdog in society. And similarly, we have different organizations that are doing it. And if it's just a TÜV in, in some way that is fulfilling such an independent watchdog function. So you, what you should do is you t should team up with all these parties that already exist and work with them gain knowledge there, have experience transfer, knowledge transfer, and by that also open up your technical side in a way that it becomes independently verified, that people know they can trust you because they trust another party that trusts you. So build up trust relationships. On the other hand, also, uh, lots of people trust organizations, so not just us, but the people they would want to give material to. So 
if there had been a good um, a good mechanism to provide information from the BP oil disaster easily, securely to Greenpeace, I'm pretty sure that lots of more documents would have been uncovered when when that tragedy happened than than have all, all actually surfaced. The, the problem also is that they have su surfaced, I mean a lot of stuff has surfaced, but it has surfaced very distributedly and you don't really have an overview about all these things. So you need some way to manage all such information also and make sure that there is an overview, that it gets where it, where it matters. Um, what we're building, as I said before, is an architecture that can provide for a couple of these things, but it's not uh, the golden bullet solution for everyone. So we have, we have a vision of a healthy size for what we are building. And as soon as that is reached, we hope that there are already other projects that are working on the same thing. And that then say, I don't know, let's take this to development countries, or let's take this just to Asia, or just take it for environmental topics, or whatever. So that a lot of clusters start to emerge, and that you at some point in time maybe only have to define interfaces between these clusters, and that you again start information and knowledge transfer all around the world. Um, yes, our system is adapted to the requirements of those that have to the need to receive leaks and would like to work with us. So we are we have over a period of a couple of months now defined some of these requirements. Um, we will start a testing phase in January, where with five or six organizations, and these are media organizations, uh, NGOs, and independent media organizations too, that we will collaborate with um, in, an order, in order to gain the first experiences in the use of the system. So to make sure that we get feedback on if people get along with what we built, if the tools are good, if they have specific other requirements, and as soon as we have gained some experience from that, we will move into a beta phase. That beta phase is foreseen, at least as much as I'm aware right now, sometime in April or uh, in May maybe, around that time. And I think by the summer, I'll talk about that in a bit too, when the camp is up, we're in a good position to be either shortly before the launch or use the camp actually to um, involve more people to help us build the final tools that we need for launching it properly. Yes, one important, um, one important, it's actually the last bullet point here. Oh no, the, the second last is important too, um, just to have that explained. Um, so what we found out with this monolithic approach that Wikileaks has is that you have to leave the standpoint of neutrality because you have to pick on who you're working with. So in the beginning it was, the idea was to stay neutral and to, to just publish things uh, for the public, and the public would read it, and um, would understand it, and would maybe even write analysis about the material themselves. But that really never happened, because you need someone to spawn interest on a topic. So especially if you have very complicated information, then people do not understand that complicated information just by looking at it. You need the media, and that is something I'd like to stress, you need the media trustworthy media to give you an introduction into a topic. And ideally, you should have a source document that comes with this introduction in form of an article so that you can read the introduction. You can find out, wow, this is amazing stuff, this is outrageous, um, whatever. I want to know more about it. And then you can read a source document. You can read all source documents that are the basis for that information. And you can, first of all, dive more deeply into the topic and you can also have an independent verification of if what has been written about it is actually factually correct or if it is just political stuff or a spin or whatever. So the problem is that if you just pump it out, um, it will drown. And the counter problem is that, is that media always, or at least in most cases, they want something exclusively. And they don't want to, they don't want something that everyone else has already, just because that's not how media economics work. So the 
The consequence of that was that uh, in WikiLeaks we started to cooperate with a couple of media outlets. From my perspective, when we started doing this and when we started negotiating these things, so last year um, we had the first collaboration which was with um, Detlef Borchers from Heise and, uh, and the Stern um, on the toll collect material. So the idea there was just to get some feedback, get a feeling for how this works. Um, how does that scale? What, what do you, how do these people need to have access to things? How is communications going and all these things? Just get a feeling for it. Um, what has happened over the past few months is that there is sort of it, uh, the developing development in WikiLeaks is going towards having more of a static team where you're sort of focused or stuck with a certain partners that you have. Um, but I don't see that it's, it's going anywhere. And I think it, this cannot be solved because you have to take the pick. And if you take a pick, that's a political decision in some way. It is a decision that you think someone is doing better work than someone else or that you think they have a better, more critical angle on something or whatever. And the only person in all of this environment that actually should have an opinion on this and that has a right to have an opinion is the source. Because that source might know that this is just important to one, one small town somewhere and they know who might be interested in it. Or they, they feel that the newspaper they are reading and they started trusting over time that these are credible people and that these are the people he would want to give information to. Or maybe he, he knows that a certain newspaper has just published a story on a certain topic and it's about the sources uh, department he's working in or she's working in. And um, so she's given away these documents uh, to a newspaper because they already had background stories on something like this. So it's perfectly natural to give that decision to the owner of the material if you so want. Um, that's how you can, as a service provider, how you can stay neutral. You just have to enable lots of, lots of entities to receive and then the source has a free pick. Now what happens is that if a source now can pick a newspaper or an, an NGO or whatever and give them a document, there is a potential that that document would just remain there and they could decide it's not in our interest um, to report it. It's politically not interesting or economically not interesting or whatever. Um, and we'd not run a story about it and we could, ju could just put it in a drawer somewhere and just let it rot and it would never come to light. So that's not what we want to, to get at either. So we need a mechanism to avoid this gatekeeping that might happen. So there will be a mechanism that you as a source, uh, you can specify if you want a document to only remain with one newspaper. That is acceptable in some way too. Um, maybe you're just five people in a department that have this material. And you would know that however the source document is published, it would always compromise you as a source. But you would still want someone to work on the material and create a story. So you can specify that the material should just remain with one particular organization. The default, though, is that you specify a certain amount of time that each receiving entity can get for a document. And if the document is not worked on in that period of time and is not published by that entity that originally, originally received it, it within the system is distributed to the rest of the community so that everyone else that is in that whole pool that you now have got, you've got tons of organizations in there, they all have experiences, they have resources, they have people that want something useful to work on. Um, they need, they are hungry for, for new stories. That's, that's their business. Um, so you just open something up for someone else and maybe it's economically interesting for someone else or it's politically interesting or you suddenly have material that is so important that from all sorts of different political angles people start to report about it. So it's diversifying this whole field, it is creating more dynamics. And that approach in the end will make sure that even if the first recipient did not publish a document, the document at some point in time is always distributed within the system and as the system is diverse and it involves a lot of different organizations, there certainly is going to be someone who publishes it. And if it is only a project created 
that does nothing else but publish everything that no one else had an interest in publishing. So um, th these dynamics can make sure that in the end all information gets to the public and on the other hand you can still work with the economics that you have within a given system. Okay, those were these two points. The last point of what we do is the cleaning of documents. This is a very complicated process. Um, it needs to have a lot of attention. And on the other hand, you need a lot of experience to do it. So again, why reinvent the wheel? Why create one organization that, that says it has the resources for, for all of this? Um, it has the resources to understand submissions from whatever department of whatever government in the world, from whatever company, to detect mechanisms to identify um, a particular copy of a document to, to know about all traps that can be somewhere in metadata of documents, to know all about how to redact certain information maybe before publication because it contains personal data that shouldn't be out there, that is not necessary to, to be put out there. So why reinvent all of this if you have tons of organizations that have already built up this experience, exactly that experience over, the, over decades? So again, pull all of these people together um, their experiences together and, and use that knowledge to build a system that can safely clean documents and provide them to people that want to review them. Um, yes, that's what we do. We provide uh, documents that are, that are cleaned in such a way that they can be analyzed by reporters and that they can also be published by reporters if they want so. What about the release part? Yes, that's something I'd like to say. As I said before, we are not into releasing documents ourselves. That is really important to understand. Uh, we believe that in the same way that lots of people should receive documents, in the same way there should be tons of organizations publishing these documents so that not the, the, the recipient part can so easily be attacked. So you have a, a vested interest in defending that. If your anonymous post drop is being attacked, you will have hundreds of other organizations that have an interest in defending your right to have this post drop because they run one themselves and that's what they want to defend. And in the same way, it's like peeing into this internet pool. Uh, if, if, just too, if just enough people publish stuff, they, I mean, there's no way to, to, to get something back again. And that's what we feel it should be worked towards. It's not, not one entity that is publishing something and then making bits, big, big hype about any attack on, on, on that publication, but rather just avoiding all of that distraction by publishing it in a fashion that it doesn't make any sense to, to try to push anyone into taking it down in the first place. Um, that choice has to be made by the recipient. So again, the recipient can specify if he would want their data to be published or if it is something which should be the default or if they would want to just spread it to someone so that they know about it. And all of that concept in the end um, will help uh, to protect all of these parties that have an interest in, in releasing information too. So, one point that we are facing at the moment is the whole part of how do we involve people or organizations that want to cooperate with us. Um, for the alpha test phase beginning in January, as I said, we have uh, six organizations. That is a sort of a hand pick. It's, um, it's all done by us just because these are people we have uh, started to establish relationships with in the last few years already. Um, it's small organizations too, that is something that's important. We don't want to want to fly as high as possible within the shortest amount of time, but actually go step by step. And the best way to get first hands-on experience with some of that stuff is just to start off slowly and start off with small organizations that do not overwhelm you with the interest they have, with um, the, the attention they get and all these things. So. At some point in time, though, we'll have to decide about all these things. So um, in January, um, hopefully in January, late January, I guess, we will start looking into creating a German foundation that is supposed to be set up to give this whole idea at least an organizational structure, a body where we have a proper board where all sorts of decisions that need to be taken that are 
political, and some of these will be political, um, can be justified by running, through a running them through a proper board where people can answer on why they have been taken that decision, why it becomes transparent, what roles and responsibilities are, and actually who is taking any political decision that might be controversial. Um, and the same goes for, for people we want to involve. So right now we're looking at um, just picking 50% of the part participants of um, that uh, system by ourselves, just because there are so many contacts we have built up where we felt organizations have been doing good work, um, reporters are very compatible with us too. Um, that should be, that should be um, valued in some way and it's just the natural way it is. I mean, we're really drowning in emails from news organizations especially and NGOs all over the world that want to start collaborating with us. And um, it might just be an easier way to just include some of these directly. On the other hand, we feel that uh, the community should also define that. So that's why we would, at least right now, like to split it up 50-50, so that there is, first of all, a bit more easier process where we just pull in obvious um, users that, that uh, I think are beneficial, or we think are beneficial. And then, on the other hand, have a popular vote for the rest of the participants, so that it becomes transparent who you want in there, and you can vote people in or out. And I think that approach makes sure that um, we'll see a lot of diversity, too, within that group. And um, it will make sure that entities for sure get in there that the public al also trusts, even if someone might not be aware of, of um, such a high level of trust for a particular organization. So we want to be neutral. That is what we are aiming at. And in that way, we're not only going to work with established media or even media at all. So there will be independent media too. but. Um, we're also working with NGOs, and not just Europe, but basically all over the world, hopefully. Um, we're also thinking about maybe involving labor unions or other organizations. There are a lot of research groups where um, investigative reporters team up in, in a research group, or there are, might be academic groups that have good potential and good funding to work on certain aspects. So. We're trying to get this as diverse as possible, just to make sure that whatever need we have in society at least is covered um, on one way or the other. Um, yes, so that's just some, some more general stuff. Uh, we don't want a single entity vendor lock-in kind of situation, so we do not want to create something as proprietary that uh, we're locking ourselves in or so. Um, we want to be as open and transparent about all these things as possible. We want our knowledge to multiplicate, to distribute it to others, to open it up. This is why this whole open thing is in the name as well. And we want to kickstart a community that, become, that gets very efficient tools in collaborating with each other uh, in, by then maximizing the impact of these publications, by having efficient tools, by having efficient means of communication, of collaboration, and all these things. And that cannot only be driven by commercial interests or exclusive contracts or anything at all, but what you need is to build a community that has a vested and shared common interest in pursuing that goal. We want to enter uh, lower the entry barrier. We had some of that already before. Um, make sure that there's different instances of leak sites grow, foster and grow competition so that this whole, even people that are building up similar stuff like we do, that, that this whole field is being, just being diversified as good as possible and made robust by that. Um, the devil is in the detail, that's something important too, so I'm, we're all pretty sure that we forgot about a lot of things. Um, this is all just an overview also, so there's more detail that we have already, but for sure we haven't covered all of it. So as soon as we launch and as soon as we start putting together the first parts of that community, it will be very helpful to get feedback as well. So we'll have to see on how to not drown in that feedback. but. Um, we also believe in the, uh, the principle of many eyes. Um, I think that the community here should know about that also. I mean, it just makes sense that you have more people looking onto your concepts and giving them a thought and getting feedback and then not taking this as a stupid criticism by someone that doesn't understand what he's doing, 
but actually taken this as critical feedback that might help you to evolve. <coughs> it's the only way how evolution happens in the first place. It's by someone being critical about something and thinking about how to do it differently or how to do it better. So, um, yes, we're going to add all of that stuff and we even have more information. We have a very nicely animated video that will explain, let's say, the whole system a bit better with a nice voice over text. And all of that is going into the website we're currently building that was supposed to be launched already two weeks ago or so. Um, we're going to launch it in January. Um, and at the next camp, and that's really important, uh, we'll, let's say, get going with this community. Um, we'd really like to have a nicely defined hackathon where we would like to give you some challenges that you can work on, where you can help build us some stuff where at the end of a camp, you hopefully will find out that the, the, the few hours you spend on, on, on building one of these smaller projects that we might have, that they actually have an impact and that they can readily be used and they make a difference. So we believe that this is the right approach and uh, that's what we're looking for. So just last slide, a few um, comments. We do not use any social media at all right now. So whatever Twitter account you see is not ours. Uh, quite unfortunately, someone is blocking the OpenLeaks Twitter account and as long as we are not fully uh, armed up to our teeth with uh, trademarks and copyrights and whatever, um, until that point in time, it doesn't seem to be possible to get that Twitter name back. Um, if someone out there has a possibility to help with that, we'd be really, really happy just because um, if you look at when the followers dropped in, it was immediately after the name was announced and they're not tweeting anything anyways. So it's, it would just be very helpful and we are open leaks. There shouldn't be a doubt about this either. So um, yeah, consider whatever account you find uh, fake unless we declare it otherwise on the website. And everyone, please keep in mind that we really have to start from scratch. So we don't have anything. Um, <coughs> I mean, even all the money we invested over from our private funds has gone. So we have to start from scratch and um, we have the expertise. It will just take uh, some time and um, hopefully some contribution from the community too. So yeah, I guess that's it. Um, we have a few minutes left. If anyone has any questions, uh, I'm in a way better shape today. So I hope we can kick this off. And thanks again for all the interest. <laughs> Thank you very much for the, uh, for the talk. Please uh, put up your hand yeah, if you have a question. The guy in the light shirt. I will try to reach you with a microphone. Thank you. Um, I have two questions which belong together, kind of. Uh, you talked about how to integrate people that want to help, uh, integrate yes. uh, developers and integrate people who well, maybe um, remove the metadata and so on. Uh, first part, uh, have you thought about uh, open sourcing all the source code as early as possible so that there can be some, some kind of uh, open source community built up? And uh, I, I think this might be a kind of a self-runner because many people are interested and uh, this is how open source works. Um, second part, uh, there are some people that you have uh, to trust very strongly, um, for example the people that remove the metadata because they may be uh, seeing the, the name of uh, the source and so on. Um, how do you intend to pick those people? Okay, so um, first of all the metadata part. Um, uh, that, that whole process of cleaning documents and standardizing them in some way should be as automated as possible. That's first of all what you have to consider. So you have to make, ideally, in that process there would not be any human interaction in a way that someone, I don't know, would do, have to do something manually and you would have to trust that person again and again and again to not be curious about something and look, have a look into it or so. So um, as much as you can automate of of that process, um, the better off you are already. 
Uh, then again, naturally, you have to trust some of the people that have access to certain components. Um, so um, that trust problem is the only way to resolve that is by going step by step and building up your the team that you are working with slowly, um, progressing slowly and not rushing into something where at some point in time you're just so overwhelmed by whatever it is that you got into that you can't, can't scale to that anymore. So um, within this community here, I think um, it's, there's quite some experience on how to build these trust relationships. And if you look at other activist communities that exist, they have experience with how to grow these relationships over time also. And that's, again, part of the knowledge that we are trying to tap into by working with organizations that have expertise with um, how to set up trust. So um, there's, no stand, there's no definite answer on uh, like a three-point plan that you could lay out and say, that's how we're going to do it. It's going to be a process like everything else. And if anyone has experience with such stuff or feedback on, on such structures, it's also very welcome to us. Um, in respect to the source code, uh, well, ideally, I think at some point in time, uh, it would be good if it was open source. But we can't start with open source right from the beginning, just because um, uh, under making people understand how the system works is one part, and making that transparent, but giving out all the detail about how certain mechanisms work technically, um, that's a very different story in the respect to how much you open yourself up to attacks as well. So it's not entirely sure yet how we are approaching that in the mid to long term. So what we will do, and that is uh, what I think is the best approach for the beginning, is that we will have, we will work with individuals and organizations that have a good standing and a good reputation that get access to details of the system so they can independently verify, um, independently pen test, proofread, whatever, um, and, and have a look at this. And that's how we are approaching that, that topic. If we find out that actually what we build is way more robust than we thought and we are too paranoid or whatever, then we might be getting to a full transparency faster than expected. But we're trying, also trying to take that step by step. Just Im really important to understand that there will be independent review of these components. So it's not a black box that we're building up that no one will ever get to see. Um, it's just going to take some time, I think. Also, probably depending on the component, I guess there are some components of the system that can be outsourced or uh, open sourced very easily, and others um, might also take some more time in the development and stuff like that. So, But I'm also not the chief developer or anything at all, so um, that's probably something we should, as soon as the technical means are there to communicate, that can be discussed um, in, within the community we're building. I hope that answered your... Okay, I have a question, or I think there's, there's okay, there, I think there are two, there are some things. Um, please put the microphone on the soft because it starts, starts to ring. Minus 10 dBs. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, there are different things. First, release often. So, you, uh, the first thing is to put all the source code available. Second, you said that, you, you, that it could be attacked. This is snake oil. Because if you say, oh, this is special technology, we have to hide it, maybe we get uh, attacked. This is the wrong way. There's a company in, in Richmond that did this some, some time, and they are not very good at reliable software. Uh. So it's good to do this open source. Then, I think the best thing to clean the software, so to clean the sources, so if you have a document that has metadata, I think the best thing would be to make an open source tool, so it would be the, um, <clears throat> the leaker tool. So the, the source can download the tool, can compile it, and the tool starts to clean the software, so to clean the document, then the, and the tool says also, if your uh, document is clean enough, and then you can send it to some party of your organization, mm -hmm. and the organization gives you feedback, clean or not clean. And you can clean the thing by yourself and then leak it. Because otherwise you cannot trust anybody. Your organization could be, could, there could be people 
who are working for some agency. Nobody oh, knows. I, I, I completely Maybe agree. you all work for an agency. Could be. Yes, I, but sure. <laughs> anyone can work for an agency. Yes. So, so that's, I, I completely agree to your point. And what you should aim for is the best or the maximum transparency you can get to. And open source is ideal and all these things. I totally agree. Um, what I'm saying is that we are at the beginning yet and some of these questions are just not answered finally and you'll just have to, to bear with us for some more time until we find out or until we have a, t a proper timeline on how all that will be done. What do we do in, in what order? And Yes, well, I mean, yeah. You, you won't find people that can download a tool, you see, and compile it themselves and then clean a document. That's where the, the, user, the, the users are not capable of doing that, you know. So it, it's not like open sourcing stuff is the answer to everything. That's, I, I'm a big proponent of open source. Um, I'm using open source software myself exclusively for quite a while already. But, um, I'm just saying it, it depends on the use case and these things and we're not going to burn time on developing stuff that's not functional that's just not what right now there is no place for that and huh Delete it. No. <laughs> okay okay well, thank you um, unfortunately we ran out of time here so we won't be able to do any more questions please give it up again for Daniel Domschatter thanks for great talk thank you very much